12, and we're going to read verses uh, 31 through 37. And uh, mine's got uh, two different titles there. Uh, your Bible may have something similar. And I've got a couple of other versions of the Bible over here. And uh, they all, every one of them's got something different for the, particularly verses 31 through 37. Uh, Schofield's the only one that's got one, any kind of title for above verse 31. And it says, the unpardonable, unpardonable sin of scribing to Satan the works of the Spirit. Uh, and then he has 33 through 37, destiny in words. Uh, English Standard Version has a tree is known by its fruit. And the New American Standard Version, words reveal character. So let's uh, read these verses for 31 through 37. Wherefore I say to you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Verse 33, uh, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. The tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by the words thou shalt be, for by thy words they, thou shalt be justified, and by thy words they, thou shalt be condemned. Uh, now, before I get too far carried away, uh, we're going to pay a little bit of attention there, verse 36, every idle word, and I was looking to see what the other translations for sure had, and the uh, English Standard Version says, I tell you on the judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, and verse 36, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. I've had people, maybe you've had people, kind of mumble. Maybe I'm guilty of that sometimes too. Mumble something under your breath. Oh, I, oh, I didn't mean that. Well, Scripture says that every idle word, every careless word that men shall speak, we're going to have to give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Uh, for a child of God, that per might perhaps mean that some reward, some crown that we would have won otherwise, we let our careless tongue get in the way of that. So if you look back with me to verse 31, we, most of my life, maybe most of your life, you've heard that there's an unpardonable, un uh, let me put it this way, a sin that will not be pardoned. And just what, you say, well, just what is that? Well, we're going to try to dig into that just a little bit. Uh, verse 31, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Now, this is... The Lord's words. I tend to forget things. Uh, I'm I'm trying right now to think what I had for supper last night, and uh, I'll 
Either I'm going to tell me after a while or I'll think of it after a while. Right now, I don't know. I could not tell you what I had for supper last night. But something 35 years ago, I could probably tell you play by play. And what I'm trying to say is God forgives, do we? Uh, Bobby Walton, his definition of forgiveness is this, and I, I've shared this with you, share it with you again. You know that you have forgiven someone when whatever happened is not the last thing you think about. When you lay your head on the pillow at night, right before you go drifting off to sleep, that ain't the last thing you think about. And when you wake up the next morning, it's not the first thing that pops in your mind. I'm thankful that the Bible tells me that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath God moved, removed our transgressions from us at the moment of salvation. But look here what he says here. Every manner of sin. I'm just going to throw a name out there. Did you know that my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ died for Adolf Hitler? He died for the sins that Adolf Hitler committed. And most of us know about what he did. Most of us know what Charles Manson did or what he had done. My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for Charles Manson's sins. But you, do you know he also died for George Washington's sins? George Herbert Walker Bush's sins? George W. Bush's sins. He died for Marty Mosley's sins. And he says there in verse 31 that all, all manner of sin. Now, some folks, we could list their sins. They're written in history books. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. Except one. And we're going to, as I said, we're going to dig into that just a little bit. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven men. One group of writers says this, it is a tongue sin that is unpardonable. The fact, this fact alone points to the seriousness of all tongue sins. Now, James tells us that we can uh, put a just a little old rudder on a mighty ship and steer it in whatever direction we go. But he compares that to the tongue. If you'll turn over with me to James chapter 3 for just a minute. James chapter 3. In verse number one and two, we'll start there. We might we might go a little bit further, but James chapter three, verses one and two. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, or be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. But if any man offend not in word, now, let me read that again. Let it sink in. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. And also, and able also to bridle the whole body. Verses 3 and 4. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. We turn their, about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great 
and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Verse 6, he says, the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. These writers also say Christ warns us about this to strike fear in the hearts of those who border on committing the unpardonable sin and to stir a reverence and a repentance toward God. The, the Spirit convicts a, convicts a man to turn to God, and that man has several choices to make. He can reject or he can accept. But somebody that rejects and rejects, his rejects and becomes stubborn, a fellow that, uh, of someone that refuses and refuses, his refusal becomes, as, the, as King James Version describes it, stiff-necked. Somebody that disbelieves and disbelieves his unbelief just overtakes him. Now, I want to remind you about something, something that we've, we've talked a, a good deal about here. Uh, if you'll turn over with me to... John chapter 16, <clears throat> verses 7 through 11. A lot of times I uh, quote these, and just on occasion we turn over there to them. But if you'll turn over there with me tonight, John 16, verses 7 through 11. He's speaking of when the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is going to come and what his job will be. Uh, some of his job will be. There, there's other jobs, but these are uh, one of them, and there's three parts to it. In verse 7 of John chapter 16, the Lord says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. It's very important for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost won't come. But if I depart... I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove or he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, uh, don't know if you've got a different translation of the Bible, but I, I believe I'm right about this, that every Bible that I've looked at this verse in, that word sin is not plural. It don't have an S at the end. It's singular. There's one sin that takes a person to hell. It wasn't all the things that we know about Adolf Hitler, but it was unbelief that's going, that would send him to hell. All the things we know about Charles Manson, and there's been movies, there have been documentaries, there have been interviews, this, that, and the other. But if he's an unbeliever, I know where his soul is tonight. Because verse 9, it takes what it says in verse 8, and the next three verses explains each point of sin because they believe not on me. It's not lying, although the Bible says that a liar won't inherit it. Not, a, not murder, uh, although it says murderers won't inherit it. Adulterers, although the Bible says adulterers, but it's the problem of not believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. As we said this morning, it's in Jesus all in Jesus. He is the one. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you shall see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The one who blasphemes the Holy Spirit 
does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Rejects the fact, the priding of the Holy Spirit to bring them to salvation. Says, uh, no, no, no. And what takes a person to hell? The sin of unbelief takes a person to hell. These writers go home and say this. The one who rejects and rejects, refuses and refuses, disbelieves and discontinues to disbelieve, that man deadens his spirit against the convictions of the spirit and develops a rooted malice toward God. He insists on his own way too long and refuses to surrender to God while his heart is still soft enough to be touched. I had an individual tell me several years ago, to my knowledge, he still, to my knowledge, is still not saved today. But he, I, I watched him. Uh, I don't know if I ever saw him with a hymn book, but I've watched him clinging to the pew in front of him. I've watched him during one of them, one, uh, uh, every head bowed, every eye closed. I watched him stand knowing that he needed salvation. Stare me eyeball to eyeball and not move even an eighth of an inch. Toward walking the aisle. And he told me one day, he said, Marty, I've come to a point and I'm scared. I'm scared that I've sat through service after service after service when God's Holy Spirit I know was dealing with me. I don't feel that no more. And I'm afraid that I am past that point. This past week, and as I begin telling this story, uh, some of y'all are going to know my, what my response was. I, I was asked by an individual to watch this YouTube video. He said, I, I really like this, what it says. And I, I want you to watch it, and I want you to give me your opinion of it. And I agreed to watch it. And as I began to read about what this video was about, as I began listening to one guy's opening speech, and I listened to a little bit of the other guy's opening speech, I stopped it. Because it was a debate an atheist versus a non-atheist. Let's just put it that way. I, I don't know. I, I know where this thing was held at. I don't know, theologically speaking, I don't know where the believer, where the, uh, what his stance was, didn't listen to enough of it to, to know and don't want to listen to enough to know. So... This individual asked me the next day if I got to watch it. Now, just want to tell you this. It's two hours and six minutes long. So, no, I hadn't had time to watch, a, watch it. I said, I watched a little bit of it. And he made the mistake of saying, what would you think about it? I don't like it. But why not? I don't get into this debate stuff. I don't, I don't get into that. I don't like that. I said, uh, I may, I'll try to watch some more of it and let, let you know, but I don't like it. You see, my Bible says in 1 John 5 and verse 12, he that's got the Son has life. And I don't care how full of energy someone that says there is no God is. 
I don't care how charismatic they seem to be in their presentation. I don't care how beautiful the PowerPoint presentation is, the slides that's going on behind them are. They're lost. And I'm not so sure that I want their thoughts creeping into my thoughts. Verse 32 says, Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Neither in this world, nor in the world but to come. I told you a story this morning about the individual that fell off in the river. I told that several times over these years I've been here. The individual falls in the river. He cries out to God, God save me. And then a log floats by. He grabs a hold of the log and says, Never mind, God, I've got this log. That's a lot of people's way of living as they go through life. I've got this. I'm where I need to be. Well, we're not where we need to be until Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. And the reason that it's talking in verse 32 so much about the blasphemy of the, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost has everything in the world to do with our salvation. And when we reject the prodding of the Holy Spirit of God, we're in deep trouble. I think back to the times in my life when God was pleading with me to be saved. I'm, I'm glad that he gave me more than one chance. Turn over with me to Acts chapter 24. We will turn a couple of different places there and then we'll come back to Matthew. <clears throat> Verse 24 of Acts 24, we, we find that Paul is uh, standing before Felix, the governor, and uh He begins talking to him about Jesus. And in, in this discussion are some of the saddest words, and I, I know I say that a lot, but they're some of the saddest words that you'll ever hear. Verse 24 of Acts 24 says this, After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Tell me about this Jesus again. I want to hear about this Jesus again. I I'm of the uh, conviction that the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of Felix that day. And Felix rejected the Holy Spirit. The sin of blasphemy. Of saying that Jesus ain't who he says he is. Of going against what the Holy Spirit stands for. Because you look at verse 25 and it says he reasoned of righteousness. You remember what John 16 said. When the Holy Spirit, when the comforters come, he'll convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So as he reasoned of righteousness... Temperance or self-control and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered some of the saddest words you ever hear. Paul, you, you go your way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. Uh, in my study in the Bible, Felix didn't ever find that convenient season. I believe he just committed 
the unforgivable, unpardonable sin. Holy Spirit was a hold of him. He rejected him. Turn over with me to Acts 26. Here he stands uh, before King Agrippa. He gives his testimony. And I want you to look down with me. To verse number 24 of Acts 26. And as he spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, so Festus, Festus, another guy there with the king, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning hath made thee mad. But he said, I am not mad. I'm not crazy, most notable Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. And then he gets on Agrippa's case. He says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Because as we've been talking about in past weeks, it was prophesied that Jesus was coming. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Some more sad words. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. Well, uh, in the games that I Grew up playing almost on the counts in horseshoes. Because you can get close in horseshoes. It depends on what rule, whose rules you're following. You had some rules you had to get closer than others. But that's the only game I know. In life, it don't work that way. Almost. We've got to be fully saved. Almost. Just ain't good enough. Matter of fact, he goes on in verses 33 through 37, Matthew chapter 12, to tell us just a little bit more about our words. Did you know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 33 says, you're going to know the tree by the fruit that it bears. Now, again, we've talked about fruit trees. Daddy, he can probably tell you by the leaf. There's others in the room that can tell you by the leaf. But I'm not convinced until I see a peach on a tree if it's a peach tree or not. I'm not fully convinced that it's an apple tree until I see an apple tree. Plum, I'm not convinced until I see him. Cherry, I'm not convinced until I see him. Walnut, until that thing falls off the tree and hits me on the head, I probably, I don't know that I'm going to be convinced. But the Lord says you're going to know them by his fruit. Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. The tree is known by his fruit. Turn over with me to Psalm 139. Now, we, we, we talk from time to time on Psalm 139 because I believe we're going to find in Psalm 139 that, that uh, the psalmist, I believe it's David that wrote that psalm, says that, uh, Lord, you search me, you know me. There's nowhere, and in the 24 verses, he basically says this, there's nowhere I can go to hide from you. 
you know when I lay down, you know when I get up. There's nowhere I can go that you don't know everything about me. He starts out the chapter 139 of Psalms with, Lord, I know you've searched me. And he finishes up Psalm 139 with this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. So usually when I think of Psalm 139, I think of those verses, how it starts, how it ends. But I want you to look down to verse number four of Psalm 139. It says there, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Looking back to Matthew 12, verse 34, O generation of, of vipers, how can you be an evil speak good things? For as we said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What goes into the heart, that's what's going to come out. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil, evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But then we get down to verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word, and as we talked at the very beginning, different translations Say this, every careless word that we speak, we're going to have to give an account of it in the day of judgment. What, what does these idle words mean? It means simply this. Now, it's a, it's a Greek word. I'll spell it for you. A-E-R-G-O-S, whatever that is. Argos, Argos. It means negative. And although Jesus said you're going to know them by the fruit that they bear, another meaning of the word idle is unfruitful. Granddaddy had a peach tree out back that uh, didn't ever mount to much. And he told me that the reason it don't it never mount too much was it needed another tree, needed another peach tree there. Now, uh, some of you may share that opinion. Some others of you may say, well, it's according to what kind of peach it is. Well, I'm just telling you what I was told, what I was taught. Another Meaning of the word idle is barren, ineffective. And that conveys exactly what Christ was saying there in verse 36. Everything you say, we're going to have to give an account for. Every idle word, every barren word, that just filled the air with sound. Didn't really mean much. We're going to have to stand and give them count for. Every unfruitful, every negative word. Bobby, I've watched with amazement. There's a, there's a house between us and Grassy that I have watched uh, who I've seen working there is one guy. And board by board, brick by brick, as I, I, you know, I don't go down there and sit and watch him, but as I drive by, back and forth, I've watched this take place over, I, I can't tell you how long it's been happening, but you, you imagine you take it down a two-story house, brick by brick, board by board, and he's almost done. I told him to begin with, I wonder if he's going to take that and is he going to take the shell and build? And then now the shell is coming down. It has uh, 
been been a while. And I and I I told Amy the other day, why didn't he just hire somebody? Why didn't he hire Bobby Trout to just come in there and But whatever he does on that spot, if he's the one doing it, it's going to take him longer to build it, even longer to build it, than it did for him to take the old down. And that's the way it is in life. You give me a sledgehammer, I can tear up something pretty easy. But it's going to take me a while to build something up. Every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Same laws coming to man. A man is, be, is judged to be guilty or not guilty based upon what? Most of the time it's built based upon testimony. That is, by words. Kind, gracious, loving, edifying, profitable words will testify for us, justifying us on the day of judgment. But ugly, filthy, angry, spiteful, gossiping, grumbling, murmuring words will also testify for us on Judgment Day. So which one do we want? I, I can answer for me. I can answer for me. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. One other place that we're going to turn tonight and then we're going to close is Proverbs chapter number 18 and I know usually like we said in Psalm 139 when we say Proverbs 18 I think about verse 10 but we ain't going to look at verse 10 we'll go ahead and talk about it since I brought it up the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous runneth into it and is safe but we want to look tonight to Proverbs 18 Verse number 21. Something for us to think about. Something for us to reflect upon. To ponder. Verse 21 of Proverbs 18 says this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Hmm. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'm thinking about tonight the book of Ezekiel. I'm thinking about the watchman. I'm thinking about the watchman who sees danger coming and keeps his mouth shut. And all the lives that were destroyed because that watchman kept his mouth shut but I'm also thinking about the watchman who saw danger coming and told about the danger that was coming were lives still destroyed yes but that man that watchman is going to have a different judgment than the first one because he told you see, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Have we confessed Jesus as our Lord and our Savior? Who have we told? Judgment's coming. Who have we told? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Out of the abundance of the heart, man speaks every idle word that comes out of our mouth. We're going to have to give an account for. May we be putting 
good things in so that good things will come out. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that if there's any that's listening to this, whatever day they listen to it, was tonight, days to come, that if they're lost, show them their lostness. And as your Holy Spirit works on their heart, I pray that they'll answer that knock by faith and accept you before it's everlasting too late. May we, your children, be talking. We talked last Sunday night at the end of that service that we're to store up, keep stuff, so that when... We're asked why we believe. We'll have that answer stored up. Help us, Lord, to be about your business. Have your way in each one of our lives. We, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as.